Hello, and welcome to Sobercast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting Sobercast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. My name is Kelly I'm an alcoholic, and I'm glad to be here today. I, um, can you guys hear me? Oh, good. Okay. I believe that I have three things active in my life to keep me comfortable in my own skin, and those three things are sobriety day. My sobriety date is... <laughs> my sobriety date is January 6, 1996, and the second thing is a home group. My home group is the Chicago Foxhall Group, and we meet in Chicago, Illinois, on Wednesday at 7 p.m. It's an open speaker meeting, similar to this, not this many people, and um, it's a structured meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous that's not very structured, that's geared towards young people and Alcoholics Anonymous, that's not really young people's meeting, and I, all I can tell you about that meeting is that um, everybody has manners, which is what I looked for in Alcoholics Anonymous for a long time and couldn't find, I couldn't find it in myself, let alone at a meeting, and I'm sure it's probably because I wasn't really looking for it, but my meeting, my home group today has manners, and that's a big deal. And the third thing is a sponsor, and my sponsor's name is Polly. And um, I always say this, uh, but she knows where I am uh, tonight, obviously. But I always say that, and I always say that because for um, most of my sobriety, I was unaccountable to a sponsor. Um, in Alcoholics Anonymous. I just basically sponsored myself, even though I had a sponsor by name. I never really answered anyone ever ever for about 23 years and um, I'm accountable to my sponsor and that's a big deal for me and it has changed my sobriety so um, I want to thank Alan Judy for having me um, I, I thought it was a big deal the first time I ever got asked to speak to I got asked to do anything like this. I thought that was like the biggest deal. And what's a bigger deal is that people ask me to do this again. <laughs> I, it's a, uh, I never, ex I always think I'm going to go up there and I'm going to do a really bad job and no one's ever going to ask me again, but that hasn't happened. So it's a surprise and it's a big honor and, um, it's hard, you know, it's hard to come up here and be honest. And, uh, I just hope that I can help somebody in the room today by sharing you my experience, strength, and hope, and that's what I'm going to do. And I want to thank everybody for being um, so welcoming to Rich and I when we got here. It was just, uh, it's been great, and we've only been here a couple hours, so I'm really looking forward to the rest of the um, conference. So I have a little while to tell you what, what it was like, what happened, and what it's like now. And um, I'll start by telling you that I am um, 26 years old. I got sober when I was 18. So I'm going to tell you what it was like for me that got me to get sober by 18. Um, I grew up in South Florida in Fort Lauderdale. I was the uh, only child of a single mom. My mom was a crackhead prostitute. We lived in a trailer park. Um, it was, and I'll just describe it for you. And before I get way into this, I'll just tell you that because of the steps of Alcoholics Anonymous, I know today that what happened to me in my childhood doesn't have anything to do with the fact that I suffer from alcoholism. And uh, I didn't know that for a long time, but because of the steps, I know that. So I'm just going to give you my history, but it doesn't have anything to do with me having alcoholism. And I'll talk a little bit about that later. I, um, so we lived in this trailer park. It was three blocks long and three blocks wide. Everybody was white. Everybody was like, like, white trash. It's like the best way I can describe it. Pickup trucks, Confederate flags. I hope I don't offend, offend anybody. <laughs> like barefoot women and barefoot pregnant women. And uh, there was a lot of cat. I remember there being a lot of cats, a lot of broken down trailers. A lot of people didn't work. Um, it was white trash and it was home to me. And this trail park was surrounded by the projects in Fort Lauderdale. And I, this, this trailer park was surrounded by the projects in South Florida, and everybody in those projects were African American. So um, I went to school in a school next door named Riverland Elementary, and I went to school where almost everybody was black. And um, it was the first time I going back through my life, it was the first time I can ever remember there being some serious 
um, signs of me having alcoholism before I ever picked up a drink or a drug. And what happened to me is I felt uncomfortable at this school. And I don't know what a normal person that doesn't have alcoholism would have done, but what I did is I really wanted to be black because everybody was black and I wanted to fit in. I was desperate to fit in. And I started telling everybody I was half black or a quarter black or something like that. Now I had blonde hair and blue eyes. I obviously don't have any black in me. And um, I don't know if people believe me. I'm sure they didn't. But the scary thing about it is that I believed me. I, after telling that lie for so long, I really believed that I wanted to be a quarter black or half black, whatever I was saying. And, um, that is a pattern that, you know, it's changed. But if I was suffering from untreated alcoholism today, it would be the same. It would be the same for me. Um, that was what it was like at school. They beat me up. They call me cracker, poor white trash, trailer girl. Um, there was a lot of violence in the trailer park. I was like the leader of the pack, kind of bossy, which hasn't changed a lot. Um, and the treehouse was in my backyard. I was calling all the shots. I was doing my best to control the situation outside of my, outside of the trailer. Um, I peed in my pants until at 10 or 11 years old. I didn't want to miss anything. I like to be the last person at the party, the first person there and the last person to leave. I don't want to miss anything. And that started at four or five years old. Um, what was going on in the trailer was a lot of sexual, emotional, physical abuse. I was the victim. Um, I, I've done a lot of work on that now, but what I can tell you then is that I felt powerless inside of that trailer. I felt powerless because of what was happening to me. I felt powerless because of what I was seeing my mom do, what I was hearing my mom do, what I was hearing her say. I felt very powerless. So I had to search outside of that trailer to get power and in the beginning, I got it from lying, pretending to be somebody I wasn't, and then I got it from trying to control and manipulate situations. It hasn't changed much. Um, so that was what it was like for me. I, uh, a wonderful thing happened to me at about 11 or 12 years old. My mom smoked pot, and um, I'm going to tell you about my first drink. It wasn't a drink. It was a joint. I know this is an Alcoholics Anonymous meeting, and I hope I don't offend anybody else. Um, <laughs> but I, my mom had roaches in the ashtray. Everybody knows what those are, like little, maybe not joints, little <laughs> joints. I don't know. Um, they know. Okay. So my mom would have those in the ashtray and, uh, I would go around and I would collect them during the day and, uh, or during the week I would collect. So the first time I did, I collected all these roaches. I probably had like, I don't know, 12 or something like that, 14 maybe. And I unrolled them and I rolled them up in a joint like I had watched her and her friends do. And I was by myself and I smoked this joint by myself. And, um, it was just like you hear anybody else talk about. It was the best thing. All of a sudden, it was okay that I was Kelly Anderson. It was okay that I was white. It was okay that I was not religious. It was okay that I had never been baptized and I was convinced I was going to hell. It was okay what my mom was doing. It was okay we didn't have a kitchen table. We weren't celebrating holidays. Um, I'm sure you guys can relate. Everything was okay. When I put it in my body, it was like, all right, it was magic for me. And, um, similar to what Alcoholics Anonymous and this people like people in this room are able to do to me is what that joint did. And, um, I was hooked, not physically, I'm sure, but I was hooked to the effect produced and which is what it talks about in the doctor's opinion. It's why I smoked joints after that. And it's why I drank. I drank for the effect produced by alcohol. Um, so just like anyone else, I started with pot, started drinking probably the next weekend. Um, I was, uh, you know, I think I was 12 and I wasn't really a social drinker. I was somebody that took like a couple Budweiser's out of the refrigerator and put them in my room. I drank drank warm Budweiser in the beginning and that never stopped. I always preferred a warm Budweiser over a cold one. And, um, I just drank right after that. I got into, um, actually it was 
between third and fourth grade, I was like nine years old. So this is actually before I started using, but I got into a school that was for people who are accelerated in math. It was called Nova. And at this school, they ship everybody from all over Broward County to go to this school. And um, at this school, everybody was Jewish. So I ran into another problem. You know, that was in like third or fourth grade. By the time I was in eighth grade, I was like half black, a quarter Jewish. You know, I was like totally confused about who I was. And this was all before I found my solution, and uh, which came a few years later. But I was just not happy being me. And uh, uh, like, you know, I wasn't pretty enough. I wasn't skinny enough. We didn't have enough money, you know. I was uh, I was embarrassed about my mom. She had a 77 Plymouth Duster. It had no floor floorboards. It was like the Flintstones car, and um, with black tinted windows. And um, I remember I used to get invited to these bar and bat mitzvahs, Anna, uh, for. Anyways, I used to get invited to these big, like, parties, and uh, I would have my mom drop me off, like, three or four blocks away, and I would walk in this fancy dress, and, you know, that was one of the things I needed to make amends to my mother's my, my mother for. I was totally filled with pride before I ever picked up. I had so much pride. Everything I had and that was given to me was not enough, even because I did get good things. And uh, I was an only child for, I mean, an only grandchild for eight years. And my grandparents, the first and only and the oldest, they really took care of me. And anything I really wanted or needed for, I got in the summertime. I flew to Chicago in the summer, and my grandparents took care of me for three months. And, you know, they had no idea of what was going on and what was happening to me in Florida. And you know what? I never told anyone. I never told anyone. I never asked for help. I never made a plea to get out of the situation I was in. I was full of pride and full of arrogance and self-righteousness. Like, I can take care of this. I'm going to be okay. And then as soon as I got drugs and alcohol, alcohol off, I was off to the races. And um, so that was 12 when I started partying. I got sober at 18. I can tell you some facts about what happened in those six years. Um, I did everything I could. Whatever you had, I would do. I tried everything that was put in front of me. And um, right after, uh, I think I was, right after I turned 13, I turned 13 in May. That summer I went, was the last summer I went away to stay with my grandparents. When I got home, my mom picked me up from the airport in this old 77 plume duster. And she said to me, we moved. And I thought, Okay, we because we had moved a lot. And when we got there, we were living in this little house in Fort Lauderdale in the middle, middle of the, it was on Sis Drunk and Martin Luther King Drive in a horrible neighborhood in Fort Lauderdale. And it was a little house and it had three bedrooms and it was split up into three efficiencies. They were tiny. And I was in a room, efficiency number three, and it was eight by 10. And um, it had mildew carpeting on the floor, a single-size mattress with no sheets or blankets on it, no pillow, a college-size refrigerator, a tiny little sink, a small bathroom with a stand-up shower. And in Florida, the houses are up on, like, blocks, bricks, because there's a lot of flooding. And the floor was rotted out in the bathroom, and you had to, like, balance yourself to go to the bathroom. And I remember my mom unlocking the door, the deadbolt to this little room that was going to eventually cost me $90 a week, and going in there and thinking to myself, like, this is great. Like I can live in this room and lock my mom out. So she can't come in and go through my stuff. And, um, you know, about two minutes into the situation, my mom said, I'll try to stay out of your way in here. And we were going to be living in that eight by 10 room together. And it didn't last long before I left. I stayed with friends. You know, when you're in a situation like I'm in, you can really play it out. You can really get your girlfriend's parents to like take care of you. But I was a troublemaker. I was a bad girl already at 13 years old. People's parents didn't want to take me in. And now I look back, I didn't want help. I was the big victim when I got here, and now I have a different understanding of what it was like for me. Um, but it was horrible. So I lived in that efficiency. My mom eventually, I moved back in. She moved out. She moved into the first um, efficiency, number one. I lived in number three. It was $90 a week. I did whatever I could to... Um, I, I did whatever I could to pay the $90 a week, and most of you know what that is. I'm not proud. I'm very ashamed of what I did, but I had to do it, and I realize uh, it's a part of who makes me who I am today. You know, I uh, those, you know, four years or six years that I partied hard, I, I, um, 
I never once in the in the big book. I love the big book, and it says. Um, to the, his alcoholic life is the only normal one. And to me, that was my, it was a normal life. I didn't once think I might have a drug or alcohol problem. I didn't once think, um, I need to get out of this situation. Maybe I should ask for help. Maybe real families aren't living like this. I thought it was a normal way to live. And I liked the way I was living. I started getting in trouble at 14. I went to jail for the first time for a felony. I had five felonies before I was 18. Um, I spent from almost from my 16th to my 17th birthday in the juvenile penitentiary. I'm not a real criminal. I just want you guys to know that they were all like possession of cannabis. I was just not real fast. Um, so like when the cops were coming, I was like not able to like get out of there as fast as, you know, other people. So I always went to jail, but, uh, and then, you know, they you take you to jail and if you're a minor and they can't find your parents, they let you out on your own recognizance, which I thought meant you didn't have to go back to the court date. Well, that's a felony too, if you have a lot of those. So I was always getting in trouble. Um, I wasn't very smart. So I dropped out of school freshman year. I thought I had learned enough there already. I have journals that I started writing at 12, 13, 14 years old. And I, I literally wrote in there that I thought I learned enough at school. It wasn't about not having the clothes or the, um, it wasn't about not being able to get there. It was about really thinking that I was so smart that I didn't need to go to high school. Just so much pride and arrogance. And um, a wonderful thing happened to me. I um, I hadn't seen my mom in eight months. It was in uh, 1994. She, The last time I ran into her was in a crack house. I ended up actually um, becoming what my mom was. By the time I was 17, I was... I was the person I hated the most. I was doing exactly what she was doing, drug-wise, for a living, everything. Um, and I ended up running into her, and I didn't see her for eight months after that. And um, I remember a couple times in those eight months thinking that she, maybe she was dead. Um, maybe I was even happy about that. And um, on December 23rd, 1994, I I drank a bottle of Southern Comfort, and um, I was drinking pretty heavily at this time, but drugs were still my number one priority, and I fell down and I broke my nose on Mexican tile floor, and I don't remember doing it. I remember being thrown in a pool um, in late December in Florida, being cold, having sweatpants on, trying to get them off, and I remember that's the last thing I remember. I guess what happened is while I was trying to get the sweatpants off, I fell down. I smacked my face on Mexican tile floor. I remember waking up in the morning and just my face being huge and looking in the mirror and being like, I'm not the elephant woman. I was just like, I looked deformed and, um, I was washed out. I hadn't seen anyone in my family for years. My mom, like I said, was eight months. I, I didn't have a place to live. I had lost that $90 a week efficiency. I didn't have anything except for two book bags. One of the book bags had two photo albums in it. The other one had a couple sundress dresses, a couple of pair of broken sandals. I was, I was broke down and beat down and, um, now my face was looking bad, and I was sure that the guy that I was shacking up with here at his house for the last couple of days wasn't really going to want me around with this face. And um, I remember going with him to the beach and sitting on the beach, commercial beach. My husband and I were just there on the pier and uh, looking out over the ocean, you know, so dramatic. But it's what happened, and um, thinking, like, you're, you're going to die. And... Um, I just like heard it. I never had those feelings before. I mean, I was suicidal my whole life. At five years old, I tried to kill myself for the first time by jump, jumping off the trailer. But a lot of those suicidal thoughts stopped when I started using drugs and alcohol. I believe that drugs and alcohol in a way saved my life. It saved me from being a teenage suicide. Um, I just had this feeling that I was dying, this thought or feeling I don't know where it came from. I don't know why it came, but it told me, call your grandparents in Chicago and um, tell them you want help. So this was on now Christmas Eve of 1994, and I called them, and I said, I'm in Florida. 
I haven't seen my mom in eight months. I know you really don't understand the situation and the condition of what's going on down here, but I need help. If you fly me up there, I'll go into treatment or something, which I had never met anyone that went into treatment or anything. And, um, they said, okay. And on January 12th, 1995, I got on an airplane and I flew to Chicago and, um, so I've been there almost nine years and, uh, <laughs> I remember my friends taking me to the airport. There was like four or five carloads of my friends. Everybody was trashed. The night before, m my friends and I played this game called Kill the Schlager. We only played it once a year, and we did it only for a big deal. Everybody would get a bottle of gold Schlager, a big bottle, and we would try to kill it. I never could, but uh, they played it for me, which was a big deal. And uh, the next morning, everybody was hungover. I remember going to the airport, saying goodbye to everyone thinking that I would really never see them again, maybe a little bit hoping I would never see them again. And uh, I remember getting on the airplane and drinking Bloody Marys all the way there in first class. I didn't have a first class ticket. I wasn't old enough to drink. I was 17. Um, I just, I made it there. When I got there, I was passed off and they couldn't, w passed out and they couldn't wake me up and they had to wheel me off the airplane. And um, they wheeled me off the airplane and, uh, my mom was there to pick me up, and uh, my mom had been there about seven or eight months, and my mom was about four and a half months pregnant, and she was 45, and uh, she was fat. <gasps> I always say that because when you grew up with a crackhead for a mom, they're not fat. <laughs> and she was fat and I can remember saying that or she was heavy I should say that she'd probably appreciate that she was heavy and um, she had a little bit of a sparkle in her eye and I remember thinking that something had changed about my mom and um, she picked me up I went right into Elmhurst Hospital um, it's a hospital I did not go to detox I went to the regular hospital I had I'll tell you the condition that I was when I got there from that airport I had um, long dreadlocks with bugs in them. I had a bladder, kidney, and urinary tract infection. I was malnourished and dehydrated. And I had a sexually transmitted disease called scabies from head to toe, which are like body lice. So I was itching. So I had scabs all over me. And I was 94 pounds. And um, I was dying. I was right. Um, that thought and feeling that I had had two, two and a half weeks before sitting on that beach was accurate. Uh, I didn't have a long time. I had done damage at 17 years old to my liver and kidneys, and um, I was spiritually wiped out. And in Bill's story, he says, uh, I remember hearing them say to my mother and my grandmother, she might, she could die. Like, if she doesn't, like, stop the behavior, like, she could die. And um, in Bill's story, he says, I knew and almost welcomed the idea. And I remember laying there knowing and almost welcoming the idea that I was going to die because I was just done. And um, when you don't have any self-esteem and any self-worth and you're that sick, I mean, my thought was, why even go on? And uh, I remember them telling me that you can't do drugs anymore. And uh, I heard that loud and clear. But I figured alcohol wasn't a drug. A drug. And um, the... I'm, I'm going to tell you about the last 11 months of my using. That was late January 1995, and I got sober January 6, 1996. Uh, I'm so grateful for those 11 months. Uh, those 11 months I drank alcoholically. Had I not had those 11 months, I might not be here with you guys tonight. You might have a different speaker. I might not have been able to get sober in another 12-step program. Um, I drank alcoholically. I drank Budweiser and Southern Comfort on the Rocks. I drank every day. I drank every day to the black in a blackout. I lived in a small, tiny apartment, one bedroom apartment with my mom in Villa Park. She had my brother in May. Um, my brother was born with Down syndrome and um, autism and hearing impaired. And um, she like couldn't deal with it. So she put him in his crib and she went back to smoking crack and drinking box wine. So here I was this, you know, I was, just about to turn 18 when he was born and I had this little brother in this crib and I would wake up with these horrific hangovers I would think about throwing him out the window suffocating him throwing him off the balcony my thinking was absolutely out of control I um when I did not have alcohol into my system my thinking was like 
rapid wildfire. It was like I couldn't even catch on to one of the thoughts that were going by. They were going by so fast. And just thoughts that don't make any sense to anyone. Thoughts that I thought I would never be able to t- I thought I would never be able to tell anyone I thought about suffocating my brother. I was ashamed and humility of those thoughts. But those are the kind of thoughts that I had, um, suicidal and homicidal thoughts all the time. Um, so my drinking in those last 11 months was horrible. I drank as much as I could. I got waitress jobs because I couldn't read or write. Uh, you could just write like over easy O-E. <laughs> it was very easy to be a waitress when you couldn't read and write. And um, I just worked and I drank. I drank in Villa Park in sports bars and uh, I took men home that were three times my age. Some of them had no teeth. Those were the kind of people that I were hanging out with. I was bringing them back to my mom's house where there was an infant who needed 24 hour day supervision who wasn't getting it, who I would change his diaper and it would be like five or six days old, the diaper he was wearing. And um, about in June of that summer when my brother was about a month I was in a bar and I, I guess there was a guy there and he was driving from Colorado, I think, to Tybee Island, Georgia. And, uh, I think I said I wanted to go with him because I woke up there like two days later. I don't remember the trip from Chicago to Tybee Island at all. Nothing. Um, I lived there on that Island with him for two and a half, three months till Labor Day weekend of 1995. I drank every day. It was the worst. It was my bottom. There was a bar in every corner, no grocery store, no gas stations, no mailboxes. Everybody rode bikes, even though there was actual roads. It was where I had my bottom. It was a wonderful place. I had a fake ID, even though I was 18 now. Um, I didn't even really know this guy. And I'm sure there's women in here that can relate to that. And I lived with him eventually around Labor Day weekend. He did ask me to leave. I, um, I wasn't very fun to be around. I was always trying to drown myself and stuff. And, um, he would have to like come into the bathroom and pull me up by my hair. Um, I was a little bit obsessed with wanting to die, but, um, I did come back. I came back in September um, Labor Day weekend of 1995, I moved back in with my mom. I got a job at a place called the Copper Kitchen. I had one real bad, I, I was drinking every day, slicing my arms now. I started slicing them, going into Elmhurst Hospital once, maybe twice, maybe three times a week. Sometimes I would go a couple of weeks without going in the hospital. They would put me in a 24 to 72 hour watch. I was obsessed with trying to kill myself. I would cut myself over all over my arms, walk into my mom's house and say, look what you did to me. I was the biggest victim you've ever met. And, uh, I took no responsibility for my actions. A- absolutely none. And, um, so I was working at this restaurant. I had one really, really bad drunk in October on Halloween weekend. I was the kind of drinker that started drinking on Thursday. I worked Monday through Thursday. So Thursday through Monday, I drank. I pretty much stayed out. There's bars in Chicago and Mannheim that are open 24 four hours a day, seven days a week. So I would just go there. And um, my blackouts started to get in really bad. And uh, in the beginning, I didn't have real bad blackouts. And I couldn't really understand when girlfriends of mine or people that I would be drinking with couldn't remember. But in the end, I started having these brutal blackouts. And I, I would wake up like with other people's clothes on and clo- in, in other places. But the scariest one was this after October, um, 31st Halloween weekend, I woke up in somebody else's sweatpants. I was home. I didn't know how I got there. The outfit I was wearing and my purse were nowhere to be found. And somebody called on the phone and it was this creepy guy from the neighborhood who my mom used to, you know, sleep with. And, you know, he said something like, I have your stuff. And I just remember thinking like, you know, I'm done. Um, I went to work the next day. There was a girl named Heather in the restaurant that I worked in and, um, she was sitting with an older gentleman in a booth. She was taught. She looked great. She looked fabulous. I used to see her in all the bars and she would do crazy, stupid stuff like I would do. And she looked great. And she was talking about how great her life was. And she said something about the 12 steps and (coughs) excuse me. I had never heard of the 12 steps. Um, nobody I ever know got sober. I never heard of anybody in from the trailer park. People didn't go away to like Hazleton. Um, they didn't go away. 
at all. And um, so I didn't know what she was talking about. That night I went to Borders Bookstore. I bought a book called um, Dumping Your Hang-Ups Without Dumping Them on Others. And it was a 12-step to getting rid of all your problems book. And I went home that night in this single bed with my brother in the room and I read these steps and I got through like the first six or seven steps that night. And, um, I thought I was on my way, you know, um, they, it, the book gave me a lot of hope. It was the first time I even addressed that maybe I had a problem. And, um, that was in, you know, probably the beginning of November and on January, January 17th, 1995. Um, I was working at a restaurant. I was working at the same restaurant that I'd been working at since Labor Day weekend. And AA members would come into this restaurant. And um, the waitresses would say, uh, here come those AAs. And we would all be like, ooh. You know, nobody ever wanted to wait on the AA members. <laughs> in case you didn't know that. And um, I don't know why. <laughs> um, but they didn't, and I would, I, because I'm a chameleon, I would say, oh, you know, and I would pretend like I knew what an A was, but I didn't know what an A was. Um, and, um, towards the end, after they started coming in for a while, uh, they would ask for me to be their waitress. And, uh, I don't know why. <laughs> Maybe it was because I was like 90 pounds. I had a you know a blue uniform on that was three or four sizes too big. I always smelled like Southern Comfort. I had a flask of it in my pocket. I could not read. I could barely talk. I always said the wrong words at the wrong time, which I still do a lot. And uh, they would ask for me. And I would never admit this to them or to those other waitresses, but I enjoyed waiting on them. Um, they were they were great. They were you guys, you know. And um, they were young and old and gay and straight and male and female, and um, they were people that normally would not mix. I was certain that I wasn't going to mix with them. Um, I still didn't know what they were a part of. Um, and I, they, there was a guy that always sat at the head of the table, and his name was Eugene. And he, he was like 12 years sober, and he was like really old. And he used to say, um, he used to say Kelly, you're going to die before you're 21. And I'd be like, great, you know, <laughs> good, bring it on. And, um, he, um, he took an action that, um, I will never be able to even the score. Uh, he came in on January 17th, 1995 at eight o'clock, five minutes to eight when my shift was over at eight and he brought, and he tricked me. He brought, um, two of the cutest newly sober guys I've ever seen in my life. I mean, like, I was 18 years old. I still haven't seen anybody like these guys. I, I'm serious. And they were like, um, they sat down. I sat down with them. I used to sit down with them and smoke all the time, you know. I was just out of it. And, um, you know, they were like, do you want to go to an AA meeting with us? And I was like, AA, BA, you know, like, I'll go anywhere with you, BB. I would have went anywhere they were going that night. Um, that's the truth. I didn't know where I was going or where they were taking me, but I knew I was going. If those guys were going, I was going to be there, you know. And, um. So, yes, I followed men into Alcoholics Anonymous, but um, it was, uh, I got sober at an AA club. It was called the Nona Center East. It was in Villa Park, Villa Avenue. Um, it was in between BP Sports, BP Sports Bar and Friends and Company, which are the two bars I drank at. Oh, Nona Center East was right in the middle, and I never knew it was there. Um, I, I went to my first meeting. It was 12 to 15 men. All of them were much older than me. They took me in the back room. They had what is called a first step meeting for me. We don't have many of them in the city of Chicago, but in the suburbs, they, if it's somebody's first meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous, they bring them back and they give them a first step meeting. And they bought me a big book. I still have it and use it. Um, and they sat around the room and they went around the table and um, I spoke last and uh, they talked about alcoholism and they talked about what their life was like and um, what it was like now and 
you know, to tell you the honest to God truth, I don't remember a lot. I don't remember if I could even identify with what they were saying about losing things. I had never had a DUI. I had never lost anything as far as I was concerned because of drinking. I never tried to control my drinking as far as I was concerned at that time. Um, I just knew that I was beat down and, uh, I was there because of those guys. Um, luckily these people in this meeting said, um, they said, I remember them saying two things. We're going to love you until you learn to love yourself. And, uh, it was a long time since I had heard anybody say anything like that. And, um, it really was important for me to hear that at the time. And the other thing was keep coming back. Um, which I did. I came back for two weeks. I came back every day for two weeks to the eight o'clock meeting. And every day I came back, I came back drunk. Um, I'm never rude to a drug drunk person in the meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. I know that I had to be drunk to get there for those two weeks. And I know because a, that's what happened. And I've been sober since then. And I know because I was so messed up and screwed up and just saturated that I missed it, and I'll explain that to you. I, I continued drinking. I drank at Friends and Company, and then I would go to the 8 o'clock meeting, and then I would go to VP Sports Bar, and I would come into the meeting after having a few drinks and be like, hey, you know? And everybody was like, hi. They were really super nice, but um, which is probably why I kept coming back because the people in the bars weren't that nice to me anymore. But um, on January 5th, 1996, I had our speaker called Pontiac Joe speak. It was a Saturday night meeting. It was, uh, they had a steak the first Saturday of every month at this place. I got sober steak night where they had food and then a speaker after that. And he was speaking and I could swear he was talking to me like dead at me. And I'm sure he wasn't, it was a big meeting. I'm just really self-centered, but he said a couple things that changed my life. He said, um, the first thing he said is this program really works good. Um, and I think I was drunk, but he said, this program really works good. And then he said, it works a lot better if you don't drink. <laughs> and I remember being like, oh my God, like nobody's drinking here. Like <laughs> I was just like, I, I mean, I had no idea. And I can remember like these ladies that didn't like me at all. They were like, finally, she got it. You know, like they were, it was, I couldn't believe it. I could not believe that was what was going on in these meetings that I had been going to for two weeks. I was just, I couldn't believe it. So I went home and you know, he said another thing. He said, when you get home, put your keys under your bed and say, thank you. And in the morning at night before you go to bed and, and in the morning you take your keys out from under your bed and you say, please. And he said, that was how you begin a relationship with God. And he went on to say that God is how we stay sober. And because I was listening after he got my attention that this program was about not drinking, I was going to find out what you guys were up to, you know? <laughs> and, um, I did that and I haven't had a drink since. And, um, you know, I used to say, I used to lie, but, it was a big problem of mine, but I used to say a lot from behind the podium and I've prayed every day since then. And I haven't had a drink and that's not true. There's been mornings. There's been days when I've been so mad at God. I've refused to pray. There's been days I forgot, but every day since then I've been active in this program of Alcoholics Anonymous and every day I've take actions in Alcoholics Anonymous that didn't make any sense to me, you know, that I didn't want to take making my bed and brushing my teeth, which sometimes I still have to be reminded of, they don't make any sense to me. And I don't really understand how they helped me to achieve such a wonderful life and good sobriety, but they have. And that's what I've done. Um, I only have a little bit longer and I just want to tell you, um, what has happened to me since January 6, 1996. And, uh, I'm not feeling good and I'm going to do my best to, uh, keep talking here, but I will tell you that, um, I'm going to try not to cry the whole time I'm up here. Um, I went to a meeting on Thursday night and at this meeting, it's called the California group. Their format is they call people up and they ask them how A is working in their life. And you get to share for like two or three minutes. And I was thinking that day, like if I got up and I was to talk about how A is working in my life, like 
I was thinking about what I was going to say when I got called up. <laughs> That's how self-centered I am. <laughs> but um, I was thinking what I was going to say is like, the way it's working in my life is that I have more gratitude today alongside with more fear today than I've ever experienced in my life. I don't know how you can have gratitude and fear at the same time, but if you can, I have them both. And I'll tell you why, you know, my early sobriety, it wasn't easy for me. My mom was still smoking crack and drinking box wine. My brother was, uh, he was about six and a half, seven months old when I got sober. I got sober going to these meetings. I would bring them with me. Everybody smoked. It was when everybody still smoked in meetings. And um, I would bring them with me on my lap. And everybody would say he was my kid, which he's not. And um, it was just, it was horrible. I would go home. My mom would blow crack smoke at me, throw wine in my face, tell me I was never going to make it. And um, I was crazy. I didn't get a sponsor. I got a sponsor by name, but I didn't start taking any actions. I didn't, I lied. I told everybody I was 21 when I came into the program. Nobody knew I, my age because I was afraid. If I told you guys I was 18, I wouldn't be allowed here, you know, because it's AA. Don't you have to be 21 to be an alcoholic? And um, so I lied to everybody. I didn't tell anyone what, what was going on for me living with my mom. So I'd go to these meetings and I would like just, talk in these meetings, just a bunch of crap. Nothing was true. I wasn't asking anybody for help. I wasn't telling them what was going on at home. I was trying to work and I was shaking all the time. I spilled a couple bowls of, of hot soup on a cl two clients, actually two days in a row. And I got fired and lost my job. So now I wasn't working. I was just hanging out at this club and I was taking the same actions that I was taking before I got sober, I was still taking them in Alcoholics Anonymous. I was not getting any better. The only thing that was different was that on, um, and I, I didn't know this then, but I know it now, on January 6th, the de desire to drink was gone. And it's one of those phenomenons that I can't, I can't explain it. Um, I was the person that would drink all night, wake up in the morning, look at myself in the mirror. I would have things like new tattoos that I don't remember getting, bruises that I don't remember getting. I would look at myself in the mirror and I would say, I'm not going to drink today. I don't want to drink today. I would take a shower, you know, five, ten minute shower. By the time I was out of the shower, I was, you know, getting my clothes on as fast as I could to walk across the tracks and get a bottle of Southern Comfort or and Moretto, whatever I could afford. So that was what my life was like every day. And all of a sudden on January 6th, I didn't, have, I didn't even have the desire to do that. I really have not had the desire, a strong desire to use or drink in almost eight years. And I, there is no way to explain that except for that God came into my life. Not came in, I'm sure he was already there, but he took it away. Um, it was so... I did everything wrong except for not, except for I did not drink everything that I could do wrong. Everybody was older than me when I was 30, 40 and sober. I met a group of young people. I got involved in young people's service work. I started, um, doing work on like, uh, young people's conferences. I started, I was an alternate GSR for two years and then a GSR for two years. And eventually I was a DCM for two years in my district. And I started working up in service. I got, I even got a service sponsor. I studied the 12 traditions, but as far as the steps were concerned, I didn't want to have anything to do with them. Uh, for like almost two and a half years, I just did not want to have anything to do with them. And at two and a half years sober, I got a sponsor. Her name was Marina. She sat me down and I, I said, before you start working with me, I want to let you know that I don't know if I'm an alcoholic. I'm 21 years old. I like this life better than I like my other one, but I don't know if I have alcoholism and I'm scared to tell anybody that. And she said, well, you know what? I'm going to take you through this big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, and we're going to start at the beginning, and we're going to read the preface and the forewords and the doctor's opinion, and we're going to read every single chapter, and we're going to read them word for word, line to line. And, oh, you can't read? I'm going to read them to you, and I'm going to let you diagnose yourself with alcoholism because if you don't have it, you're free to go. Because this program isn't for people who are drug addicts or have mental problems. This program is for people that suffer from alcoholism. Alcoholism, do you have it? And I, I didn't know. So she took me through the book. It took a long time, maybe six, seven, eight months to go through the first step in the big book. Um, and by the time I got to the end of the chapter, more about alcoholism, where it talks about needing a power, a higher power greater than yourself or your you're dead. You will drink again. We have no defense against the first drink. Um, I was scared. 
I knew I had it. Um, it's a scary feeling to go through the book word for word and realize what it's saying about alcoholism and know that I have a mental and a physical disease. I have a physical allergy and a mental obsession that keeps going and going. I was so afraid. I was so afraid when it talks about um, that there could be a time where I won't remember the suffering and humiliation of even a week or month ago. That really, I'm without defense. I don't just not pick up every day. Because according to the big book, I could again. Like, I could go through a period where I can't remember the suffering and humiliation of a week or a month ago unless I have a good relationship with my higher power. According to the big book, I have a daily reprieve. And she was reading all this to me, and I was reading it. She would read it to me, and then I had, like, six sponsees at the time that I would go home and I would read the chapter. She would read the chapter to me, and I would go home and I would read the chapter to them. And I was learning this material, and I was getting more afraid and more afraid and more afraid. And I went on to the second the second step and I went on to the third step and I, I did work about God. That's, I mean, I'm only eight years sober. I've done minimal work, but what I know is that I realize that it's my responsibility to connect to a higher power. It's my responsibility to connect to a power greater than myself. And it's my responsibility to know the actions that I have to take daily to connect to that higher power. I heard a speaker that talks about, it's like we're unplugged. And everybody else is like plugged in to God and we were just born unplugged and my job every day is to plug back in and you know some mornings today I wake up already plugged in but sometimes I don't. Sometimes something happens in the middle of the day and I get unplugged and it's my responsibility to plug back in and um, I took the steps really seriously from that from then on like about two and a half years sober I Polly started sponsoring me about two years ago. Um, I didn't know this until she started sponsoring me, but I don't think I was, I was five years sober when she started sponsoring me, five, five and a half, something like that. And I don't think I was ever honest with anyone ever in my life until I met her. I uh, heard her speak at a convention about six months before I called her up and um, she was living in LA. She gave me 45 minutes of her time. Everybody said, don't call a circuit speaker. <laughs> And I said, well, I just have to call this woman. I heard her speak, and her son lives in town, and she has a nephew who's hearing impaired, and she's done all this work, and um, I just, I, I need to call her. I just knew that I needed to call her, and I called her. And, you know, for somebody who everybody said was going to be really busy and wasn't going to have any time for me, she gave me 45 minutes that day on the phone. And uh, I was in a lot of pain. I was newly married. Um, I, I was feeling like at five years sober I was falling apart. And, um, there was, uh, cause I wasn't being honest and I didn't know it at the time, but I had a sponsor who thought I was a real good AA member. So I was really good in service. That I really sponsored a lot of women that I was a good sponsor. I was a good home group member. She thought I was a good AA member. So what I wanted to do was keep her thinking I was a good AA member. So when I would have a bad thought or do something bad, I wouldn't tell her the truth. And, uh, with Polly being so far away, it's easy for me to just blurt out the truth or over the phone, like, listen to what I did. Because, um, what I get from my sponsor today is love, 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 love. And, um, there's no, not a lot of, there's no judgment from her. And, uh, that's what I need to stay sober. So that's what I need to, keep being honest. So the last thing I want to talk about is, um, just two quick things. So I went, I got my GD when I was about three years sober. Um, I learned to read. The first thing I ever learned to read was how it works. People in Alcoholics Anonymous took time out of their lives and of their days to teach me how to read. I, I started going to community college. People would come over, they would help me with college. They would check my papers. I ended up getting straight A's and, um, it's easy to get straight A's in college if you do it like you do AA, if you come early and you sit in the front and you raise your hand and you ask stupid questions. Um, it's it's really easy. That's, that's what I did, and I got straight A's. And I worked at this job. I got a job when I was a couple months sober, and I ended up staying there. And I got laid off November 6th of last year. And um, it was devastating. I was making a lot of money, more money than anybody in my family, in my immediate life, anybody had ever made. It was a lot of money for me. It was a lot of money for a person with a GD. And um, 
I got laid off. They downsized. They cut like 24 out of the 26 people in my department, and I was devastated. And luckily at the time I was working at this place part-time doing sales, and I was working there because somebody in the program said to me, would you like to do sales? And I said, well, I do accounting. Like, I'm a bean counter. I work by myself. I don't want to do sales. And I don't want to sell what you guys have to offer because that means I'm going to have to go into these big law firms and, you know, use big words. I'm dumb because I have an old idea that I'm dumb because I was in the retarded classes. And um, I remember I said, I talked to Polly. Polly said, you should really take that job. A couple people said you should take that job. And I told this guy, I'll think about it for two weeks and I'll let you know. So on my way to work, after about two weeks, I called Polly and I said, I need your help. And she said, what's up? And I said, I want to call this guy and tell him that I don't want to take that job part-time doing sales. And she said, oh, you, you're going to take it. <laughs> <laughs> and um, she said, that will be good for you. And, um, you know, this the guy that asked me said, you can sell Alcoholics Anonymous better than anybody I know. If you can sell Alcoholics Anonymous, you can sell my business. And um, he was right. I mean, not about selling Alcoholics Anonymous, but about selling his business. I uh, I did great, and I loved it. I loved doing sales. I loved being there. I loved the people I was working with. I wasn't making any money, and there was this feeling in my heart that said, like, this is the right place for you. So when I got laid off, I got a lot of other job offers, and I'm still getting them almost a year later from the industry I was in. And um, th these people basically offered me a job there. And uh, the middle of November of last year, they, the company was really struggling. And they said, um, if you come on and you work full time we, and we get out of this mess, we will make you a partner. And I said, okay. And my husband said, um, we will downsize. We will get rid of one of our cars. We'll move into a small apartment. If you feel like you need to work here for some reason, I'm going to, I'm going to support you in working here. And, um, he, that's just the way he is. He's great. Um, and in March, um, third, 2003, the owner of the company decided that he was going to step away. And, uh, I remember the day it was a uh, black Monday. That's what I call it. It was a Monday and it looked like there was 25 employees and everybody was going to lose their job. And my husband wasn't working at the time. He was actually working for this company part-time driving and, um, it's a courier company. And I remember thinking like, it hasn't been that long for me since I've been in the unemployment line. So it's not going to be that bad to be in unemployment line tomorrow, but if I was to run into one of these people that work here in the unemployment line, like that would really stink because they had families and kids and they needed their paycheck. And I talked to my husband and, um, this guy basically that owned the company, he said, if you guys get like $5,000 together or something like that, right? He was like, you guys could buy this company. And, um, if you ran it right and didn't make the mistakes we've made in the 10 years, this is a profitable business. And, um, Rich and I talked about it and I don't know what happened, but we were just like, let's do it. And, uh, we talked to some people in the program, actually all of the people we talked to are in this room right now. And, uh, it's funny, but the closest people to us, my husband and I are in this room and, uh, the person said, go ahead and do it, do it. And he helped us and everybody has helped us. And on, um, March 17th, 2003, I came, I became a 25 year old business owner and, um, it's like six or seven months. My husband and I have been partners in this business. And, uh, I just want you to know that like, I have been through a lot in my sobriety, you know, in eight years, having your whole adult life, you've been through a lot. I, 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 I lost both of my grandparents. My mom had a heart attack. My mom got sober and since I've been sober. She's also relapsed since I've been sober. I've watched my brother, who's eight, now grow up and have a lot of problems with his downs and his autism. Um, I've been through a lot. I got married at five years sober to my best friend. I had, uh, you know, a big wedding with a big white dress. I, I wanted to get married in a courthouse because that's what I thought I was you know, that I deserved. And my sponsor said, you are going to have a big wedding. And I did. I had a big wedding. I, I've been through a lot, but I said this to Rich, I think the other day, it seems like 
I've never really been really beat down. Like you go to people, meetings with people, and I thought I had. I mean, I, I had a bankruptcy. I've lost jobs. I got a, you know, a $30,000 car stolen by a newcomer when I was four years sober, and I didn't have any insurance. I had no insurance because you don't need car insurance. Um, and, I mean, it, like, ruined my credit. It was horrible. I mean, I... I have I had always thought that I had been beat down, but I go to meetings with people who really have humility and stuff like that, and um, I don't think I've been beat down. And with this business, I'm getting a butt kick. I mean, I'm getting my butt kicked. Uh, and I'll just say real fast that we have business because my husband and I believe in the in the constitution or the principle of sponsorship we have business coaches we have people who that's their job is to coach us in this business they're like sponsors we're accountable to them and um, i'm i'm beat down with them every time i am beat down i'm humbled i'm humiliated i don't know how to run a business for the first couple months i'm like i'm a 25 year old business owner look at my new shoes you know, like, I was like, had no idea what I was doing. No idea. And, um, you know, my sponsor told me the other day on the phone, um, it's a, it's, it's a surprise that I didn't drink earlier this year. I'm really earlier this year. I took actions that almost destroyed my marriage, that almost destroyed this business, um, actions that I'm not willing to talk about yet from behind the podium, actions that I hope I never have to repeat again. I hope that someday I can help people to avoid them taking the actions that I took, humiliating just bad actions because of my pride and arrogance and just self-centeredness. And um, God is good, and I'm, this is what I'm going to end with. Um, because this is really all I can say on, uh, we, my, Rich and I separated because of my actions. And, um, I went to, in April, I went to see Polly and Dave with a couple sponsees of mine in California. And when I was out there, they weren't very nice to me about how my behavior was. Um, they were nice to me, hospitable, Mr. Pistol was. And, um, <laughs> He told me he would give me five dollars for every time I called him Mr. Pistol. Up here. <laughs> five dollars. Um, and something about going and seeing them and realizing that, like, God has given me this husband that is crazy about me and this awesome life and this business and all these sponsees and this perfect home group. And my mom is sober and my brother is healthy. And my mom walked me down the aisle and she's a homeowner and a school bus driver. I mean, I have an awesome life. And they made me see when I went out there that I have this awesome life and I've just been tearing it down like because I have alcoholism and I've just been tearing it down. And um, Rich and I reconciled for like a weekend. <laughs> Is that what you could call it? Yeah, for a night. We, uh, it was just like, it was just like one of those things, you know, you know, and um, like about five or six weeks later, seven weeks later, um, uh, we went to an AA move. Um, our home group was doing an AA move. We're really active in our home group, and we happened to be together that day. He happened to give me a ride home. He was living in our, we were living together, and he was living on the couch. And uh, I went, I took a pregnancy test, and um, I didn't tell him. I wasn't feeling very good. I was a little emotional like this. And um, I I got to make a call that day. It was May 31st um, of of this year. And I called my mom and I said, mom, um, sit down. <laughs> and she said, good sit down or bad sit down. <laughs> Cause we always say sit down to each other when, whenever we have good or bad news. And I said, good sit down. And, and I, I got to say to my mom who's alive and well, you're going to be a grandmother. <laughs> and, um, like, I'm not sure why God continues to give me these blessings, even when I'm bad girl. And, um, I don't really know. All I know is that I, I don't know anything. I know that. That's about all I know. All I know is that all I hope for myself is that I'm not willing to give all this up anymore because of my character defects. Like, I was willing to trade in the farm 
because I was going through a bad time. And I just, I'm going to be a mom. I, I have to stop now talking. They're going to come and drag me off here pretty soon. But um, I, I'll have the rest of the weekend to talk to you. I, I'm more afraid, yeah, literally. Um, so just know that I'm going to talk to you. Um, I'm more afraid than I've ever been. Uh, I'm afraid to be a mom. I didn't have a very good mom. I didn't have a very good role model. I don't know what I'm doing. I've had a horrible pregnancy. I thought it was going to be awesome and easy, and I was going to be, like, doing yoga, and I was going to be this fabulous pregnant woman, and I have just been miserable for six months. Um, I thought I was going to be able to be a good mom, and now I just realized that, like, um, I thought I was going to be able to be a good business owner, and I can't do this. And, and I'll end with telling you that... Um, Thursday was boss's day, and um, on Wednesday I sent myself flowers and my husband flowers and our office manager flowers because I figured I was I was a bad boss and I wasn't gonna give any, so I better get any, so I better send myself some, and um, so I did. I sent myself flowers and boss's day came and the flowers came and me and Rich and I and Cynthia, our office manager, all had flowers and um. I just think I'm such a bad boss because I'm so beat down in this area of my life. Like I just, I have these 25 people who call Rich and I owners that call us boss. And I just feel like I've done a bad job. And, um, because of this program, like that day I got cookies and cards from these employees. I got cards that said, you're a great boss, you know? So I just know that like I, I'm taking direction right now on how to be, a good boss and how to be a good owner and how to be a good partner in this business. And as a result of doing that for only like two, two and a half months, I've been working with these coaches already. My employees are seeing a difference. Like already they're saying to me, you're a good boss, keep up the good work. So the only thing I keep telling myself about this fear about having this baby is that I'm going to be sponsored. You know, my sponsor is a mom and she's an awesome grandmother and I'm going to ask for help and I'm going to take directions and I just, I don't want to screw it up. And I have a feeling that if I stay in rooms like this and I talk to people like you, that I'll be okay. So thank you for listening to me. I appreciate it. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.